Good evening. Good evening. It's peace to you and beloved saints gathered before the throne of God tonight to hear from your Lord Jesus and receive from him that mercy and assurance that comes from his death and resurrection for you. Uh, tonight as we gather, we'll be hearing a little bit more from the prophet Elijah um, as he ran uh, to, back to Mount Sinai and he had some words for God and God had a, some words from him, to him. Uh, we'll hear more about that this evening. Uh, a couple of announcements, of course. Uh, upcoming July 16th, this is the, the second of two announcements for that, um, we'll be gathering Sunday, July 16th, following a 9 a.m. service for the um, voters meeting that occurs twice a year here, so far. And uh, we'll be discussing a few things on your yellow insert. There's a few announcements regarding that, all what's kind of a brief summary of what's on the agenda right now. If any feedback or heads up for us, let us know uh, so that we can answer or prepare any information that might be necessary ahead of time to prepare for. Um, you'll, you'll see that as well. If you have anything else for the agenda, please let us know before the end of this weekend here so that way we can get it on the paper and all that um, and be prepared for that as well. Um, you'll also see Vacation Bible School is coming up fast. Uh, we still need some, uh, uh, some resources for that. You can find every information on the back table. We also need a couple more uh, leaders for that, uh, helping out with the children and things like that. So if you're interested in maybe being a group leader and being with the children uh, for that, let us know. Give us a call. Um, we'd love to have you be incorporated into that. There are some work nights coming up for that as well. You'll see their Wednesday nights, July 12, 19, and 26, from 6 to 8. Um, anyone is welcome to come and help prepare for that, uh, help make the crafts, or just kind of set up the scenery and, and help decorate for that. That'll be coming up here this month as well. Uh, so all of that, and of course more of the newsletter will be coming out next week. Uh, so more information on that you'll see. If you have any questions or anything, let me know. Uh, let any of our elders or leaders know as well so that we can do all things well. Uh, so with that, Jesus is here to do right by us tonight with his gifts, his love, and his mercy. And so now let us prepare our hearts and our minds after this week. What matters now is what Christ is doing here with his word. So let us now stand, presenting ourselves before our God to receive from him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue this night by speaking responsibly our intro. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. O you who have been my help, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Teach me your way, O Lord. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries. Wait for the Lord. Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and 
will be forever. Amen. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and O you who have been my help. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. In peace, let us praise the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We now sing the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Congregation, please be seated as we hear from the Word this night. Our Old Testament lesson this night, and also our sermon text, comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. The Lord said, Go out. And stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down your altars, and they have killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek now my life to take it away. So the Lord said to Elijah, 
Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abba Meholam, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and all the mouths that have not kissed him. So Elijah departed from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing the field with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth yoke. Elijah passed by him, and he cast his cloak upon him. And Elisha left the oxen, and he ran after Elijah, and he said to him, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him, and took the yoke of oxen, and he sacrificed them, and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then Elisha arose, and he went after Elijah, and he assisted him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Our epistle reading this night comes from Peter's first letter to the churches, chapter 3. St. Peter writes, Finally, all of you, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for a reviling, but rather on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, in order that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life, and see good days. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor and regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Out of reverence for our Lord Jesus and his word, let us now stand as we are able and as we continue by singing the Alleluia. He was out standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Now getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Jesus asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night, and we took in nothing. But at your word, 
I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with Peter were astonished at the number of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Simon, Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought in their boats to land, they left everything, and they followed Jesus. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation, please be seated, as now we sing our sermon hymn, hymn number 688, Come, Follow Me, the Savior Spake.
saints and the Lord who are loved by him. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord who bids you to follow him. Amen. Our text tonight comes from our Old Testament lesson where Elijah goes to Mount Sinai and God calls on him, calls him to come on out and talk to him. And Elijah, we're told he says this, or God tells this to Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? You know, Elijah, he's one of the key figures in the Old Testament. He is a prophet of God who is mighty in word and in deed. Now, Elijah has lived during some very dark times in the history of his people, which he alludes to in his answer and his response to God. But Elijah also lives in a political climate that's dominated by rather strong personalities, King Ahab, King, Queen Jezebel at the moment. There's also dividing walls of hostility and an ongoing civil war among the people of God. Now, right before our text today, Elijah had his famous duel on Mount Carmel where he faced off against 450 prophets of Baal by himself. Now, their duel consisted in a contest of worship. Whosoever worship was accepted by their sacrifice being devoured from fire from heaven had the true God. Now, the prophets of Baal were given the coin toss, and they elected to receive the ball first. So they prepared their sacrifice, and they hooted and hollered for Baal to respond. And they did this for hours, but nothing happened, while Elijah sat off to the side, mocking them and their false god. When Elijah's turn came, he prepared the sacrifice, he said a prayer, and before the prayer was even ended, the God of Israel accepted Elijah's sacrifice by sending fire down from heaven to consume it. Now this caused the people of Israel to proclaim that the God of Israel, Yahweh, is truly God, and that the prophets of Baal, they were declared to be false. And the result of all of it was that all 450 of them were put to death. But this victory of Elijah's caused Queen Jezebel to rise up in anger, and she issued a command for Elijah to be captured and for him to be put to death. So Elijah runs away, and he decides to run to the place where it all began for the people of Israel, Mount Sinai. Elijah runs back to Mount Sinai. In our text, Elijah is back in the place where it all began, where Moses met with God on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, where the people of Israel were ratified as God's covenant people, and where even Moses, earlier in his life, had met with God in the burning bush. So eventually in our text, God comes to confront Elijah, and that's where our text picks up today. And this is why God asks him, what are you doing here? Elijah. God is reasoning that Elijah is not in the right place. He shouldn't be here. This is not where the prophet of Israel belongs. Perhaps that's what God meant and what he was getting at with the strong wind and the earthquake and the fire. Elijah, this is no place for you to be. So what's this text about? And what should we get from it? Elijah tells us what we should get out of it. He tells God that he is all that is left. Out of the hundreds of thousands of people that came out of Egypt, after all of the promises that God had made, all that God has done, it was all done for naught. The game is over. Elijah tells God, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts. The people of Israel, however, they have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I'm the last one standing. I'm all that's left. What Elijah sees is this. Once he is gone, it's done. He's the last faithful one left. The faith dies with him. 
Perhaps that's why he's back at Mount Sinai. It, it's rather poetic. God's covenant people should die where God's covenant people were born. Now God, he listens to Elijah. He listens to his complaints. He considers his reasons. And no doubt God is more aware of it all than Elijah is. But after Elijah is done talking and saying this, I always love God's answer to Elijah's rather dramatic response. As God listens to Elijah, he essentially says this, Hmm, I see. Well, Elijah, thanks for stopping by. Oh, and on your way back, I have some work for you to do. Go and anoint a man named Hazael to be king over a foreign kingdom of Syria. And also stop by Jehu's place, he's Nimshi's boy, and I want you to anoint him to be the next king of Israel. You see, God is letting Elijah know that God's in charge. The delusions that rulers make in defiance is laughable, because God can just go and replace them. You see, God rules the nations. He even rules the pagan nations, like Syria in the Old Testament, and the nations around us in our own day, too. We learn that the kings of the nations, they are but puppets and pawns in God's grand scheme. Every decision that rulers make, even today, even if it defies God, only falls right into God's lap. But that's not all. God then tells Elijah that he will not be the last prophet. God continues and tells Elijah that after he anoints the next kings of the nations, that he is to go and find a man named Elisha, and he will anoint him to be prophet in Elijah's place. God is telling Elijah that, yeah, your time is over, but Elisha will succeed you. And Elijah, he gets to go, and he gets to create his successor. And so with this, God is letting Elijah know that God's plans are not up to us. We are not the deciding factor. And that God has a solution to the problems that Elijah is facing. These new kings and these new prophets, they will deal with the problems and the threats that Elijah has described. Hazael will take care of the problem, and anything that he misses, well, Jehu will deal with. And if these heads of state fail in their job, well, then Elisha, the church, will deal with them. You see, God calls people into his service, and he calls them into his people, just as Jesus did. He does it still, right, along the banks of the Sea of Galilee. Come, follow me, and they leave everything, and they come. God calls we do not get to decide when we stop or when this ends. God does. As Jesus says, the gates of hell will not overcome his church. And that should be rather comforting for us. Because the church is God's creation, and it is in God's control. We do not create the church. God does. And he calls people into his church. But what God says next to Elijah is perhaps something we, we should pay attention to. God says to Elijah, Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all of the knees that have not bowed down to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You see, God has kept for himself a faithful remnant. They may not be many, but 7,000 is a lot more than Elijah thought he was when he counted off only one. Elijah thought that he was all that was left. He thought that the people of Israel had forsaken God. But God tells him that this is not so. There are yet 7,000 who have remained faithful. I've got to imagine that there was a lot of joy and relief that Elijah must have felt. He wasn't alone. God tells him that there are 7,000 thousand people who need the prophet to speak to them the word of God. Elijah cannot remain in this cave hiding. He must go back. He must be a witness and to speak of God and to make successors, to pass on the torch, those whom God has chosen who will continue the work. God's truth 
will always prevail, no matter what. God, in fact, you know, God can do much more with less than we can. And to prove it, there did come a time when Elijah's words proved to be true. A time did arrive when there was only one faithful person left. There came a moment in the history of God's people when all that remained of God's plan and mission was one man who was left. But he was enough for the salvation of all. You see, being a prophet, Elijah did foresee that the time would come when there would be one faithful Israelite left. He was just only off on the timing. The time came when every person abandoned God who betrayed this innocent Israelite, who denied him, and each scattered to their own home. There was one, one last faithful one, and that was Jesus Christ, your Lord. A man who knew no sin, a man who spoke no deceit, a man who did good to all those around him. It was true of Jesus what Elijah had thought about himself. I only am left. And now they seek after my life to take it away. And that's what they did to Jesus. They did all that they wanted to do with Jesus. They murdered the author of life. They took his life away. They killed him in cold blood. But Jesus, he did not run from this fate. He did not resist or fight back. He did not hide in a cave. He did not wait for the hate to blow over. He stood silent, resolute, having made the good confession. You see, while Elijah went and hid in a cave on a mountain, Jesus walked up the mountain of Calvary, bearing his cross for all to see. Jesus suffered. He died for the sake of the truth of God's mission, for the sake of the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus died. Jesus was hauled up on a cross in an act of public humiliation, in an attempt to say that, what, that if you happen to remain as God's faithful, that's what will happen to you too. But you all very well know this Jesus Christ triumphed. He triumphed over death and decay, and in true God fashion, the very tools that God used for his triumph were the hands of his enemies. Enemies that now Jesus has come to give peace and forgiveness by the very blood that they shed. Everyone always falls into God's hands. No one can do anything that does not have its source in God. God laughs at the tools of this world, of the devil who tries to cow God's people into submission. For God is the ruler of the nations. He has anointed his son as king. As he has said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You see, as for God, he has set his king on Zion, his holy hill, and that is Jesus Christ, who is God's son, your savior. This teaches us that God is in control. It very well may be that the sufferings that you endure, the evil that is done to you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, will but prove to be the very tools that God will use to conform you into the image of his Son. And in good time, he will use that to glorify you. Even if you should suffer and die, God will raise you up as he did his Son, because you are in him. There's nothing to fear. Jesus teaches us that everything is in the Father's hands, and we can trust him to do justice and to deliver us. My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, it often feels that we're on an island. You know, I've often found myself agreeing with Elijah's words. We're the only ones left. The world around us has lost its mind. The Christian church has succumbed to idolatry. It's lost. And we, even we only, are left isn't that what the stats tell us? Isn't that what they say of a dwindling church? That all hope is lost. It's time to circle the wagons. Last one, turn off the lights. It's tempting to retreat. It's tempting to say nothing in the face of the culture around us. It would feel better maybe to just go off by ourselves, wait for the end. 
Well, this text should teach us and comfort us that it is not so. That God, not men, control the wheels of history. And we need to believe it to be so. You know, recently, I wrote an article for the Hub City Times concerning the events and the culture that surrounds the month of June, the real reason for the rainbow. And I had thought for myself that everyone would either disagree or worse, have it out for me, Queen Jezebel moment. That it, I, even I, that's all that's left, can feel a bit like a bit like Elijah too. And perhaps you can relate to that in your life as well. But I was reminded of this text, actually, so I found it funny that this text popped up, that last week, many of you reached out to me. In fact, many in the community reached out to me as well to thank me. And what is more, to remind us, encouragement, there is a remnant that God keeps for himself. The reminder that we should not fear, though the earth gives way, because there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, as Psalm 46 tells us. But the question that I'm left with that this text got me wondering is this. How do these 7,000 faithful remnants here in our text know that there is a remnant that is so? And the thing that I began to realize is this. They are there to confess the truth too. They, you, cannot hide in a cave or in homes behind locked doors. We must be brave enough to confess the faith. We must do so publicly. We must have a light for those around to see that there is a better way to live. There is freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are here this night practicing that, confessing that, to do it in our lives. You see, faithfulness is not something practiced secretly in your home or something that's fine for individual life that stays out of the public square. Your faith in the Lord Jesus, is to be practiced and rejoiced over publicly. There is plentiful redemption and forgiveness for you in Jesus Christ. This Jesus Christ loves you. He's given you a new name, a new identity. It cannot be broken. And this is something that happens not in a corner, but for all to see publicly as you were baptized into his name. You see, Jesus Christ shed his blood for you, He despised the reproach and the shame of this world because Jesus had in mind a lasting city that he wants you to be a part of too. So let us also go outside the camp, as the book of Hebrews puts it, to endure and share in the shame of Christ crucified because we too are looking better for a lasting city, a better kingdom that is to come when Jesus, this King of the Jews, is now inviting you to participate in. The same goes out. The call still goes out. Jesus is calling you. You are his remnant to believe and confess the faith, to take courage, have no fear. The Lord will deliver. That while we will have many trials and tribulations in this world, we can take heart, for as Jesus himself said, I have overcome the world for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, amen. The grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, your Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, amen. Let us now indeed confess our faith, practice it now by speaking the words of the Apostles' Creed. As you are able, please stand as we confess our faith together. I believe in God. Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Please now be seated as we now bring forward to our God our offerings that we collected before service as we sing also the offertory. Teach us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We now sing our closing hymn this evening, hymn number 594, God's Own Child, I Gladly Sing. 